Welcome to the Knowledge for Men show. Your life will never be the same. Your level of success will seldom exceed your level of personal development. I want to die empty of regret. I want to die empty of my best work. We don't understand who we are. Instead, we're living out somebody else's narrative. What one man can do, another man can do. If it's been done, it can be done again. Being yourself and being your truest, most authentic self in every moment. If it scares you or makes you a little afraid, do it. Follow your heart and your gut. The first stage. I think it's finding you, like finding out who I am today. Stuff will not work. You will have things that fail. Success is when you're a happy, fulfilled person. How do you define success? It's your life and you are the creator of the movie script that is your life story. The father of personal development, Jim Rohn, said it best. You are the average of the five people you spend your most time with. And so I've created a mastermind community called the Lions Den around this idea that if you are surrounded by high performing people and you have consistent education and training, then you will succeed in life and as a man. Check out kfmlion.com to learn how the Lions Den can take your life, relationships, and business to the next level. Again, that's kfmlion.com. All right, guys, welcome to the show. I'm here with Jason Hansen. He's a former CIA officer, security specialist, and recent successful contestant of ABC's hit show, Shark Tank. Hansen teaches everyday citizens to defend themselves at his spy escape and evasion school, and he's been interviewed by major media outlets for his security expertise, including the Wall Street Journal, Fox News, and the Huffington Post. Jason, happy to have you here on the show. Thanks for having me. Oh, it's an honor. I'm excited to have someone from the CIA here on the Knowledge for Men show. And so, Jason, we kickstart off every show with a favorite success quote or maybe some sort of saying that you've lived by that's helped you on your journey. So go ahead and share what you got for us. You know, it's it's popping in my head, and I'm probably going to butcher the heck out of it because I think it all the time, but I haven't said it out uh, loud in a while, and I don't know who said it. But it's the one about the gazelle waking up in the morning and the lion waking up in the morning. And, you know, it doesn't matter if you're the lion or the gazelle. you just got to be wake up running. Do you have any idea what I'm talking about as I butcher that quote? <laughs> no, I, I've heard the quote. I've heard the quote. It's, it's about the grind. So, it's about the hustle. Right. And so I get up at 5 a.m. every morning and, you know, I do my power hour, get things done. So I'm a big believer that you got to work your tail off, be up early and hustle, as you said. So that's my favorite quote. Now, have you been doing this for a long time, getting up early? You said you do an hour of power. Could you go into detail what that is? What, what, what do you do during that hour? Sure. So, yeah, I'll tell you my routine. So in college, it probably was like most college kids, you know, stayed up till 4.30 in the morning and never dreamed of getting up at 5 a.m. But as soon as I started my own business, got in the business world, I realized how much you have to get done. And I, as they say, you got to work 12 hours a day, whether it's the first half or the last half or half a day. So I work from 5 a.m. to hopefully 5 a.m. to get home to my family. Um, but at 5 a.m. I get up and I call it my power hour because I'm doing the most important thing of the day. And maybe you're writing an article and maybe you're working on a project or a product. And it's the most critical thing. That way, if anything else happens, I know I've got something very important done. So from 5 to 6, I'll do that. From 6 to 7, I work out. And it may be running. It may be one of those tapes like Insanity or something. And then I shower, take my uh, daughter to school, and then I hit the office about 8, and I'm there from 8 to 5 or 8 to whenever I finish up the day. All right. Sounds like a solid routine. And what happens to you if you don't do that? If you have days where oh, things happened, you just started working right away, you went straight to email, how does that affect you and uh, your day? Well, yeah, obviously it screws things up. And I have plenty of days because a lot of my time is spent training. So I'm teaching spy courses and other things. And I may be doing things where I can't get up at five because I've been up late doing training. So I try and stay in my routine as much as possible because, like you said, if you get out of it, it screws you up. You sit there, check email. You're not getting your most important thing done. So I try to stay in my routine as much as I can. Yeah, yeah, got it, got it. Well, I'm interested in your career here. Share with us a little bit about how you got started with what you do with the CIA and what your career was like with the CIA and then going into what you do now. Sure. So out of college, my first job was with a local police department. And then the CIA and the Secret Service offered me jobs. I felt the agency would be a heck of a lot more enjoyable and exciting, so I went there. I was there for about seven years, and I left in 2010. Yeah, wonderful place to work. They treat you very, very well. I had no complaints. had a lot of fun. Uh, but I wanted to move on for or move on and do different things, and I had the entrepreneurial bug. 
So when I left, I started my company, which is called Spy Escape and Evasion. And so I teach spy courses. Uh, I teach people how to escape duct tape, rope handcuffs, how to pick locks, how to detect lies, um, home defense stuff. So I teach all this safety and survival. And we've got a 320-acre ranch out in Utah where we do a lot of it. And then some of the courses I travel around the country giving this training. Yeah, got it, got it. And so these things that you're teaching other people, this is stuff the CIA taught you, or this is stuff that you had to use on your in your job. You know, you're going to hear me say this a lot in this interview when you ask questions like that. I can neither confirm nor deny that question, <laughs> so I'm not going to go there to get in any trouble with the agency. <laughs> okay, okay. I like this. All right. Well, what would you say then, maybe kind of stepping out from things that you did inside the agency, but maybe just some life lessons? Like, what would you say is the most important thing you learned in your seven-year career with the CIA and why? You know, I'll t- I tell you, for what I do, I call it survival intelligence. Other people refer to it as situational awareness, but it's really having your head up and being on your A game. So you and I both know that everybody walks around texting with their head down, not paying attention. They almost get hit by a car or they almost bump into a light pole. Right. And so most crimes are crimes of opportunity. It's some crackhead won his next drug fix. So he stands out in front of the local mall and he's watching people come out saying, who's going to be the easiest person for me to rob? Well, when I come out with my head up looking around and make eye contact with him and somebody else comes up with their head down, he obviously chooses them. So that's, you know, that's something so simple, but it's the foundation for keeping safe in everything I do. That way you see the threat coming because you're walking around your head up. And as I told you uh, before we started uh, recording this, I don't even own a smartphone. I've never sent a text message in my life. I have a flip phone. <laughs> you got to you gotta go into detail. It's 2015. I don't. I haven't seen a flip phone. I, I mean, are you on a razor? I haven't seen one of those in, in almost ten years. Uh, why? So I'm on a flip phone. I'm on the, whatever the cheapest flip phone they had when I got it from Sprint. So I, you know, I don't even know which one it is. Um, multiple reasons. From a security standpoint, is everybody stores way too much data on their smartphones. So easy to hack in there and get all your personal protection stuff, steal your identity. And people treat smartphones. A lot, they're more lax with it versus, let's say, a laptop or a desktop. So people are always losing their phones, always losing that information. Uh, but another huge reason is a business reason. So everybody's, you know, texting and doing all that junk on their phone where when I'm working, I'm working. So I don't want anybody to text me, send me whatever the latest Instagram picture is, any of that is I want to work. And then when I'm done, if I need to talk to somebody, they'll call me on my phone. So it's a big time saver for me. Yeah. Okay. Okay, and any plans to ever get a smartphone? No, but I got a business partner who has been nagging me and bugging me like crazy, but no, no plans to. I mean, there's no need to. I, Like I said, when I'm working, I'm working, and when I'm with my family, with my family, I don't want to be bothered by any of that stuff. And if somebody needs me, they have my number, and they can give me a call. <laughs> Old school ways, yeah. It still works. You're probably a lot more productive not having a smartphone anyways. <laughs> Yeah, you 100% are. Absolutely. Yeah. So, you know, I get this idea of when I think CIA, I think security specialists, you know, immediately I think the general population or myself, I'm thinking like the movie Taken. I'm thinking Jason Bourne. Uh, It's just what comes to my mind. So if we're playing kind of that scenario in Taken, um, what, what would you do? What advice would you give to someone if they're out traveling and they happen to get kidnapped? So for example, like what, what do you do in that situation? Sure. So I am very well trained, thankfully. And of course, those movies are far fetched because <laughs> Hollywood has to make them look exciting and sell tickets. So one of the things I do is I teach hostage avoidance. So I teach how to make sure if you're in that foreign country, you're never kidnapped in the first place. And exactly what you do if you're kidnapped, um, that's, that would take me you know, forever to go in. But Long story short, you don't want to become the lone wolf like uh, Liam Neeson and Taken is contact the FBI, contact the authorities. So the government screws up almost everything it touches. But when it comes to hostage taking, FBI, CIA, other ones, they actually know what they're doing. So that's what I would do. That's it right there. Contact the authorities. And well, let's say you are the one being targeted and you're walking down the street, you're in a foreign country. And you notice that someone's following you. What would you do in that situation? Well, it really depends. It's a case by case scenario. So if I'm 
walking down the street and someone's following me and it looks like just some petty thief who's walking to steal my wallet, then you always want to acknowledge that person. You want to turn around and make eye contact. Because if you do what Hollywood shows do and you put your head down and you look around sheepishly and walk faster, they think, oh my gosh, that person's an easy victim. I'm going to go rob them. So if somebody listening to this is coming out of the Walmart parking lot, thinks they're being followed, well, turn around and confront that person, make eye contact so they know that you're not going to be an easy victim and they'll choose somebody else. Mm. But if it doesn't look like that to me and I'm a foreign country, I'm going to pay attention to that person. I'm going to remember everything about them. And then I'm going to call some buddies of mine, and we're going to end up tailing the tailor, if that makes sense. So I'll have somebody run a counter-surveillance, and I want to figure out what's going on. Like, why are these people tailing me? I'm going to have my counter-surveillance follow them back to wherever they came from to see, you know, are other people in danger? And, again, I don't want to blow my cover and let them know that I saw them. Yeah, got it. And and so counter-surveillance, what what do you mean by that? (laughs) So, sure. So... I'll give, you the, I'll give you a quick, easy example. So okay. I also have an executive protection company where we do bodyguard work and surveillance work for celebrities and stuff. Okay. And so we have people who say, hey, <clears throat> excuse me, hey, I think I'm being followed by a crazy ex-spouse. So let's say we have a woman who thinks her crazy ex-spouse is following her. They will hire us to set up what is called a surveillance detection route while they go a series of places. And our counter-surveillance will follow her from behind to see if anybody's following her. So you got the woman, you got the crazy ex-spouse, and then you got my team following all of them to say, yes, ma'am, somebody really is following me. Here's the guy, here's the description. Or no, ma'am, you're crazy. Nobody's been following you. Got it. Got it. The counter-surveillance. Um, it, on the topic of travel, you know, I, I, I recently just got back from a trip from San Francisco and uh, – all throughout Northern California, what would you say are like three common mistakes people make while they're traveling that really put them at risk? That's really putting them forward uh, for some sort of problem. I'd say a huge one, and this is especially true in foreign countries, is whenever you check into a hotel, one of the questions they always ask you is, you know, Mr. Smith, how many keys would you like to your room? And no matter what, you always want to say two room keys. So if some young woman checks into a hotel and in other countries, criminals will case the hotel lobby and they see that woman say, oh, I only need one key. Well, now they think she's alone or know she's alone. Now they know they only have one person to contend with. So always say two keys so people think you're with someone else. That's number one. Uh, Number two is always try and stay between the third and the sixth floors of a hotel why is that third and six floors? What's, what's significant about those floors? Yeah, well, yeah, between the three to six. So the reason is the criminals target the first two floors because they're easy getaways. So they can go rob it and then run to their getaway driver and have a quick escape. And then the other reason you don't want to be on the 99th floor is if there's a fire or some disaster, that's obviously a long way to go down. And most fire trucks in the United States will only go up to the sixth floor, that fire truck ladder. So you're kind of, up the creek without a paddle if you're on floor 99. Yeah. And then a, another very simple, easy, quick tip is just when it comes to taxis, when you're staying, if you're going overseas, you know, you can be cheap here in the U.S. and stay at some Motel 6 or dumpy place, you'll be fine. But stay in the nicer hotels overseas and always ask your hotel what taxi company you use. Never get in a ghost cab and make sure you plan your route because taxis overseas love to take advantage of Americans. So, you need to have your map that says, Mr. Taxi, you take a left on L Street or right on John Doe Street. That way you know exactly where they should be going so you can see they're not taking you out in the woods to kill you or they're not driving around trying to rip you off. Yeah, got it, got it. And how have some of these survival and uh, preparedness regimens helped you in your own life? Well, one time, and it uh, happened in Baltimore City, Maryland. So Baltimore City, as we know, is in the safest place in the world. But one time I was almost carjacked there. And so my training allowed me to escape that carjacking, thankfully, and no harm was done to me whatsoever. So I teach evasive driving and, you know, thought hopefully thought it would never come in handy, but it did. So that's one instance. And then just having a firearm. So I teach firearms classes, got great gun training. Unfortunately, I have had to draw my firearm before. And then for home defense purposes, it gives you a huge confidence booster. You feel safe at night because if, heaven forbid, somebody kicked in my front door, 
Well, I'm well trained with a gun and guns around my house, so I know how to use it to protect my family. Okay, so on that on that topic of home defense, what does that look like? Like setting your setting your home up so that you're ready, or so that you, you can make it more safe from, let's say, a burglar or someone uh, trying to enter your home. Sure. Yeah, I'll give you the Cliff's Notes version. The first thing you do is super easy and common sense, and that is case your own neighborhood. So walk down your street, look at all the other houses, and ask yourself, hey, who would I rob in my neighborhood? Hopefully the answer is not going to be you. But what you need to do is put an alarm sign in your front yard, put motion sensor lights, put video cameras, put a dog bowl at your back door, even if you don't own a dog bowl, put some of those alarm window stickers on your back door for the back entrance of your house. Because if somebody does those simple, simple things and a criminal is walking down the neighborhood, sees all that on your house and nobody else has it, they're going to choose another house. And in my own house, there's only one other uh, person on my street that has even uh, a yard sign. They have nothing else but even that one security major. So even though it's so easy and that uh, motion sensor lights and video cameras are super cheap these days, still probably 90% of the American public doesn't have anything on their house to deter an intruder. Wow. And so even, you said even if you don't have a dog, put a dog, put a, dog, put a big dog bull back there. Yeah, I mean, the, the criminal's not going to know. And if he sees a dog bull and your neighbor has nothing, he's not going to want to take a chance. There may be a dog there. Right. And for cameras, I'm thinking you could do the same thing where, I mean, you could put the cameras up, but you don't necessarily have to uh, install them. Or you, or you could even just get the signs that say, you know, your your house is secured, but are, you don't necessarily have to have, <laughs> you know, like security in the house. Or, or is that wrong? No, I mean, I... I no, no, you're, you're right. I mean, if you can afford video cameras, buy them. But you can buy the exact replicas, and they're about 10 bucks each. So I have a client in Salt Lake City, and he did not want to get real cameras. So he installed these fake cameras, and his next-door neighbor got broken into uh, the house while he was at work one day. So he comes over to my client, and he says, hey, my house got robbed. I need you to pull the video footage off your cameras so I can tell the police, you know, who robbed my house. So my client had to say, well, actually, they're fake cameras. There's no video footage there. <laughs> so it's, it definitely did deter uh, in that situation. Okay. Um, think, I'm thinking about, like, the car now. Like, uh, like wh- what, what is, like, survival things that you keep inside of your car, like, when you're driving? Things that you just must always have in your car to, to be ready. Sure. I have two different things which I keep in my car at all times. One is just a simple toolbox, so it's got your standard screwdrivers, hammers, has a tow rope, and just, you know, standard stuff like that. And then the second one is a 72-hour kit. So I've got three days of food and water. I've got my flashlights. I've got my different ways to start a fire. And I've got some other things, water purifier, you know, if I had to obviously purify water. So it doesn't take up much space at all, but because we as Americans spend so much time in our vehicles and people get trapped in the mountains or they get trapped in snowstorms, I think it's a no-brainer just to throw those two things in the trunk. Yeah. Yeah, I'm wondering, does anyone say anything? Like your friends, uh, your family, like you've got all of these like security measures. Do you have like guns throughout the house? Like do they think like, oh, you're like way overprepared? Or do they, do they, are they actually interested? Like, wow, this, I should do this too. Well, it, it depends. It actually goes both ways. Of course, there's some family members who are like, oh, you're wasting your time and they don't do anything or care about anything. Then other family members are, you know, hey, that's cool. I want to do the same thing. So I'll tell you another quick story is I have a tactical tomahawk in my skate bag, which is also what called my 72-hour kit in the back of my car. So a tomahawk is a great tool. You can use it for chopping, cutting, slashing, self-defense, all kinds of things. So I'm in Jackson Hole, Wyoming last winter, and we're coming down this mountain, and there's a sheet of ice, and our car skids off, crashes into a guardrail. And because we slid so far, we packed up this ice, and the car was stuck. So people got shovels. We're trying to dig out. Nothing works. We can't get this car out. So I go in the back of my car, I get my tomahawk, and I hack through this ice, and we're able to free the car and get out of there. So, of course, the family members who used to make fun of me for having a tomahawk were like, holy smokes, I'm glad you had that. <laughs> so just like everything else. Well, right. well once, once the crisis occurs, people are like, oh, right. I should have you know, gotten some food storage. Right, <laughs> right. 
Also in your book, Spy Secrets to Save Your Life, um, I notice you, you always carry bobby pins and a, and a paracord keychain with you. You know, can you go into that? I, I found that interesting. Sure. Yeah. So, and this is you know more for people who are traveling overseas and traveling to dangerous places. Is I teach people how to escape restraints such as duct tape, zip ties, rope, but also how to escape handcuffs. Because if you're in a foreign country and the police put handcuffs on you illegally, you can use bobby pins or hair barrettes to easily escape. And when I say easy, I mean less than five seconds using these. You can be out of them. And then you also mentioned the paracord is paracord, also called parachute cord, has some amazing properties. So you can use it to cut through things. So if you were bound by zip ties and you weren't able to break out, you could take a paracord and make a special loop with it, and you can slice right through these zip ties and free yourself. So I have a paracord keychain because I can just unravel it. It gives me nine feet of paracord, and I really only need seven feet to use it for escape purposes. So all these little items don't take up much space, don't draw any unnecessary suspicion, and can be used in a variety of survival situations. Mm. Wow. Yeah, th- this is good stuff here. You know, it's, it's a different uh, context than, than most of our shows, but I know my audience is going to be really engaged with it. You know, men wanting to good. protect themselves, protect their families, and uh, be more aware of, of what's going on. And I think a more growing threat that I think we often underestimate is um, what's happening online and kind of like social engineering scams. Uh, can you go into details about that and how we can protect ourselves from those? Yeah, I'd say the first thing that everybody should do is get a VPN, which is a virtual private network. So that allows you to surf the internet and have it encrypted, and also people won't know where you're at. So if you were to go to Starbucks today for lunch or something or afterwards, and you just got on the internet, well, that's an open wireless. And if somebody's in there, they can get your password, steal your identity, and all that. But if you're using one of these virtual private networks, it's encrypted, plus it doesn't show you where you're at. So right now I'm in Utah because that's where I live. But I'm looking at my VPN, and it looks like I'm in New York City right now. So it helps you mask that, too. So I think everybody should have that. And then a lot of it is just common sense. You know, when your uncle calls you from Nigeria for your $50 million, don't give me your password. <laughs> right, right, right. And um, going into that, like, with the social engineering and things like that, it's also a little bit in your book is how you can disappear off the grid. Yeah, this is one of the things that is very interesting and fascinating. People love, but I tell them you would not want to do this unless your unless your life was ever on the line. <laughs> Excuse me. So I do this training a lot with women who are escaping domestic violence. So they'll come to me and they'll have an abusive spouse and they want to disappear and start over. Because when you're disappearing, you're leaving everything behind. You're never going to see that house again. You're never going to get on the internet again. You're not going to see your family. So it is a really tough thing to do. Um, if people had to do it, I'll tell you where you want to go. Is you want to go to a small town that has about twenty-five to 50,000 people, and you want it to be a conservative town, so you would never want to go to New York City with all that liberal bureaucracy where to rent an apartment, they want 28 forms of ID, your DNA, and your firstborn. <laughs> right. So, so in these small towns, there are all these mom-and-pop businesses. So you can just go take a check. You know, cashier's check and say, I'd I'd like to rent an apartment. They don't care about CID. They don't care about checking your credit, any of that. And I've done this before. So all these small towns, and it can be Utah, Idaho, Florida, um, you know, again, somewhere conservative, Wyoming. And you just go to these various mom and pop businesses. You don't have to do all this stuff, which is going to leave a trail, because as long as you have cash, you're good to go. And then the twenty five to 50,000 towns, people mind their own business. It's less government, so they don't care what you're doing. And and that's where you want to go if, heaven forbid, you ever had to run away. Mm. Wow. And so, yeah, it's just it was just an interesting point in the book, not not something that uh, we always talk about. Um, So in your book, kind of if you had to summarize some of the main points, like what would you say are the top three things that you hope people would take away from reading your book? Well, there's, geez, there's so many categories I cover, such as the escaping, such as the evasive driving, disappearing, and, and gear. You know, one of them is probably the survival intelligence, a.k.a. situational awareness. So I cover that in my book. I want them to realize that making yourself safer, that's the foundation, and it's easy to do. Since everybody else isn't paying attention, if you're the one guy with his head up, the criminal is going to choose somebody else. The second thing is gear. I cover the list of gear I cover in my book, and gear makes your life so much easier. 
So, you know, the gun, the knife, and all the other things is so anybody can, you know, get that gear. So I highly recommend uh, people do that and be prepared. And then third is we, little, we talked a little bit about the driving. Is that because we do so much driving and a lot of carjackings happen these days, is learn some evasive driving skills. You don't have to be James Bond. Anybody can do this stuff. But don't be sitting in your car, again, texting. I have no idea what's going on. But learn some evasive maneuvers, especially if you're someone who travels overseas. Mm. All right. Really good. Really good insights from your book. Um, it, now I have a part of the show I call the knowledge round. Just going to ask you some rapid fire questions here to get more insights from yourself here. So are you ready for the knowledge round, Jason? I'm ready. I hope I have the knowledge to handle it. <laughs> Do you feel stuck alone or like you're not getting the type of results you think you deserve? You put in all the hard work in your life, relationships and business, but things just aren't getting any better. I've been there. That's how I started. That's where I was. I kept trying and trying to improve my life, but nothing just seemed to give. I started to think that personal development was a joke. I felt like every month I was in the same place I was the previous month. But then I found something that just worked. I grew. My business grew. My relationships flourished. And everything around me just started to click. People started respecting me more, and I finally felt like I was becoming the man I wanted to be. I created a program to help guys get the same results in their life. Check out kfmline.com to learn how the Lion's Den can radically transform your life. Again, that's kfmline.com. Welcome to the Knowledge Round, where the guests will be asked rapid-fire questions to give the audience invaluable pieces of wisdom to help transform their lives. Starting in three, two, one, all right, all showtime. Right. Uh, all right, so let's dive in with the first question here. Um, this is kind of going to be more going into what you've done after the CIA and what you're doing now. Uh, it's very unique. Um, you seem very driven, and uh, you're on purpose, and uh, you, you know where you're going with this, and, and you're seeing a lot of success. Um, what advice would you give to someone who is feeling lost, and they don't have that sense of purpose, and they're looking to find that? Well, I'll tell you, it took me about 10 years once I started looking. So once I graduated college and realized I wanted to start my own business and do something unique, it took me about 10 years. So we all have a purpose. And, you know, unfortunately, if we could figure it out, I wouldn't have wasted 10 years looking for it. But keep your head up. Keep chugging along because you will find it. I'm sure many people have heard the story about Colonel Sanders didn't start selling his chicken, I think, until he was 55 or 60. And hopefully nobody will have to wait that long. Um, but it's out there, and it's, it really comes back to how badly do you want it. I mean, a lot of people give up on life, but it is out there. So if you keep plugging along, you'll eventually find it. Yeah, really good, really good. And what was holding you back from becoming the man you are now today? You know, again, it was just figuring out what I was supposed to do. So I don't think there was anything holding me back because I was trying. I was always working my tail off. So I was always, you know, looking at opportunities or training hard at the CIA or doing whatever to try and get to where I wanted to be. And, you know, again, for those of you that are religious, it's God chooses the time. So it, it may not be the time when you're 24, 34, 44, and maybe when you're 47. So just work your tail off, because I said you're going to eventually find it. And if you aren't working your tail off, you won't be prepared to handle the opportunity when it arises. Yeah. All right. And what would you say are two or three of your most influential books that have helped you on your journey and why? Uh, you know, Think and Grow Rich. Anybody who doesn't say Think and Grow Rich is, you know, not successful or not a successful businessman, at least. So everybody should read that book multiple times. And then there's a book called Scientific Advertising by Claude Hopkins. So marketing is huge. If you want to run a successful business, you've got to learn how to market and understand sales. And so Claude Hopkins was a famous advertising guy, copywriter, and he wrote several books. So I recommend everybody read everything you wrote. All right, really good books. Uh, Think and Grow Rich and uh, Scientific Advertising. I'll check, uh, check that second one out. What would you say are... Uh, actually, oh. I want to ask you this. It's more of a scenario. And you know, imagine you had 60 seconds with your 20-year-old self. What would you tell him to do? And what would you tell him to do, 20-year-old Jason? You know, I would probably tell 20-year-old Jason that it's going to work out and keep your head up. So during my 10-year journey is, you know, like everybody else, I got down, I got depressed, life wasn't always great. And, you know, I believed in myself, so I kept, I 
kept going, but sometimes you're just like, you know, very close to giving up. So it would probably just be a better uh, pep talk of, listen, you're going to hit it big. Your dreams are going to come true. So make sure you never give up. Yeah. I, you know, so simple. But at the same time, it's it's really those simple things that really <laughs> make all the difference. Mm-hmm. Never, yep. never give up. I mean, it, it, who who th- who like what kind of uh, th- opinions were people giving you when you wanted to start this business, and and how did you deal with that? Well, as I said, I left the agency in 2010, so my friends, my family members thought I was absolutely crazy. You know, they said you have this great government job, you've got a top secret security clearance doing all these things, you know, you'd have to be absolute nutso to leave the CIA. So I was hearing that, but I knew what I wanted to do. I knew that my dreams and my plan wasn't to do 30 years with the CIA and get a, a pension. And then, of course, same thing as when you leave, you still hear the naysayers like, you know, what do you know about starting a business or you never started a business before? But it comes down to believing in yourself. You know, you can't rely on anybody else except yourself. So you got to give that self-confidence up. Plus, you have to be one stubborn son of a gun. So when I put my mind to something, I'm going to get through it and make it come heck or high water. Nothing's going to stop me. And so you got to have that attitude. If you have to charge through that brick wall, you're going to charge through that brick wall. Really good. And for the guys listening, I think a, a lot of them may relate with you when you said you had a family and uh, being able to take that leap uh, with, as a fa- you know, you're not just a single guy with by himself looking after himself. You, you, you're married, you know, your kids, like how... What was it like for you quitting, you know, I imagine the CIA giving you, uh, you know, a solid salary, you know, getting raises, great benefits um, to leave that and, and then risk uh, going into a business that is very uncertain. Well, so you have to have an incredibly supportive spouse, obviously. Right. So my wife and I, you know, talk about business a lot and she's just, she knows that I'm not going to let the family down, that we're not going to go homeless or I'm not going to let us not have any food on the table. So my wife know how uh, she knows how hard I work and has been supportive the whole way. So that's all I can say is that I know guys who have had the opposite, and your business won't be successful. You'll get divorced. And you won't be successful. So you have to have that supportive wife. Yeah, yeah, really good. I was listening to this interview, and at this interview was about eight billionaires, and uh, one of the, they were asking the host was asking them what was like the one thing that you guys all have in common that led to your success. And it wasn't being in the right industry. It wasn't being in the right market. It wasn't having this incredible uh, people like talent. Um, It it was having an incredible spouse to help them go through the ups and downs of their businesses. That was the one thing they all agreed on. Well, that's exactly it too, because not only is your spouse supporting you, but in the days, because every entrepreneur has very dark days, it's when you have that dark days and you're sitting there, you know, ready to give up, you're sitting there wallowing, your spouse is there to pick you up, to give you, you know, supporting words and confidence and say, all right, you know, you've, you've been sitting there for five minutes, now get back to work and, and do your thing. Yeah, really good stuff here. And c- coming to a close here, even if you had to summarize some of your main points, that's fine. What would you say is your philosophy on life and success? My philosophy on life is first, do the right thing. So find out what you're supposed to be doing, but make sure it's the right thing. So have integrity in everything you do. Find your calling, whatever it's going to be. So uh, as I said at the very beginning, all of us have a purpose. And then work hard. It's just, you know, I'm uh, obviously, if you haven't guessed, very conservative uh, Republican. And so many people are whiners and weak these days. We're still in the United States of America, the greatest country in the world. You can make anything out of yourself if you want to. So we have a very bright future. So just, yeah, don't give up and make sure you're doing the right thing. All right. Really good, Jason. Really good uh, thoughts there and advice for the for the guys listening. Um, now, that concludes the knowledge around there. Uh, what's exciting you today? Like, what are you looking forward to with, 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 your, with your personal life and, uh, and moving forward in your business? Well, that's, that's the beauty of it. Being a small business owner like I am, every day is new. So I've got a, a new child on the way family-wise. So that's obviously very exciting. All right. Congratulations. But I make my – thank you. Yeah, yeah. I make my to-do list every day, and I got project lists on the wall. And every day there's a new opportunity, a new project to work on, or I get an email from somebody that wants to do a partnership or a kind of joint venture thing. So that's the beauty of, of why I'm so excited. But if I stay with the CIA – I would have pretty much known what the uh, next 30 years of my life would have been. You know, I would have done 30 years, had a lot of fun, had a pension. But here, 
I wake up every morning having no idea what opportunities can arise and where my world is going to head. Yeah. And it, that's kind of the beauty of life. It really makes you feel more alive when you're in that, when you're in that state of a little bit of the unknown and uncertainty, but that's the beauty is you get to create it. And you, you put it perfectly, feel more alive. You're hundred percent right. Is you've got to feel alive. You've got to look so excited to the future. And if you have everything laid out, well, that's boring so you know where you're going. So, yes, the uncertainty does add to that feeling. Yeah, really good stuff here. And for all the listeners, you can follow up with Jason Hansen at spyescapeandevasion.com or at, you can just Google his name, Jason Hansen, and then I put CIA and it pops right up. It's number one on Google. And you can go to Amazon and check out Spy Secrets That Can Save Your Life by Jason Hansen, and uh, that pops right up on uh, his name, Jason Hansen on Amazon. I just did it right now. Um, Jason, it's been a pleasure having you be here on the show, and uh, you know it's a really interesting take. Uh, have, you know, most of our stuff is a lot more, a lot more. Uh, it's different, but this is this is really good. I know my audience is really going to vibe with it. Good. Well, thank you for having me. It was a pleasure. Thank you for listening to the Knowledge for Men podcast. Hundreds of interviews and a million downloads later, we're continuing to build an international movement, and we've just started. So if you enjoyed this episode, go ahead and leave a review in iTunes. It really helps to grow the podcast. Guys, 2015 is the official year of living with purpose, where every day you do only the things that matter to you. You wake up, live with purpose, and take massive action towards the life you want. Check out kfmfree.com to get free tools I've created to help you crush life. Again, that's kfmfree.com. This is your host, Andrew Fairby, and I'll see you in the next episode.